distinction which can be made between inequality and poverty. So some societies are highly unequal, and this doesn't depend upon their overall wealth. This is apparently a picture from Sao Paulo, which illustrates the notion of inequality. It's basically very rich people living next to very, very poor people. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the work of Wilkerson and Pickett, who are two British epidemiologists, who've made a big point about how inequality is specifically linked to many bad social outcomes, uh, including mental illness, um, uh, independently of wealth. And just to make a sort of point about the independence from wealth, just to, to, to illustrate the point, the two most unequal societies, I think, currently in the Western world, in the developed world, are Britain and the United States. Uh, the most equal, one of the most equal societies is Norway. G per capita GDP in Norway is actually higher than either uh, Britain and the United States. So you don't have to have to have... Uh, so inequality is not linked to, to poverty. You know, you can have a rich country and a highly equal country as well. Um, people talk about triple down, uh, trickle down economics. I always say there's a one word, one word argument against trickle down economics. It's Norway. Um, now, some people have actually looked at this inequality effect at uh, in terms of psychosis. Um, one issue about inequality is, is how do you measure it? Because you typically, in Wilkinson and Pickett's work, work it's measured at the national level. You compare different nations. So there's been some kind of debate in the literature about whether you can measure it at a local level. Kate Pickett, I've talked to her about this, thinks it's, is, is, is sceptical about whether you can measure it at a local level. But a, a geographer at Cambridge, um, uh, James Kirk Bride, has developed a way of doing this. He looks at particular neighbourhoods and he looks at the surrounding neighbourhoods. So... Uh, and what he finds is that the risk of the, the incidence rate of psychosis in poor neighbourhoods surrounded by poor neighbourhoods is lower than the incidence rate of psychosis in poor neighbourhoods surrounded by, surrounded by rich neighbourhoods. So it does look like there's a social inequality effect in terms of psychosis. And that's really interesting because if it's not wealth per se, which is important, then what's going on? There's got to be a psychological process of some sort. There's got to be a process of social comparison of some sort. So we should be interested in that. This is a, you know, a vital area of research for psychologists, it seems to me. Ethnicity. In Britain, it has been known for a long time that Afro-Caribbeans have an increased risk of psychosis. Uh, from, or at least been admitted to psychiatric hospitals with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or related conditions. Um, for a while it was thought that this was because British psychiatrists were probably insensitive to ethnic differences, that maybe they misinterpreted the distress of young, particularly young Afro-Caribbean males, as psychosis when it wasn't. Uh, we now know that this isn't certainly not the main cause of this effect, so uh, increased risk of psychosis has been found in ethnic communities in other countries, notably in Holland, where they've been studied uh, very carefully. But the most fascinating thing is this. In Britain, the increased risk of psychosis, and this is true also in Holland, the increased risk of psychosis depends on which neighbourhood the member of the ethnic minority lives in. So a black person living in a predominantly black neighbourhood in Britain doesn't have an increased risk of psychosis. But a black person living in a predominantly white neighbourhood has a highly increased risk of psychosis. It's something like an increase, it's, it's something about like a factor of five increase in the odds ratio. So it's a huge effect. Um, and it must be an effect which is happening at a very proximal level. It's a very, and again, it points to social comparison being, a uh, process of social comparison being important in some way. And in fact, in in Dutch studies, it turns out that the more that people feel discriminated against, the more likely that ethnic group is to experience psychosis. So again, this points to social comparison factors. My research has been more interested in childhood experiences, childhood trauma. Um, so it came out of, to some extent of, I, I, I stopped actually doing active clinical work about five years ago, just simply because I kind of didn't have the time actually. Um, but I noticed before that time that a lot of my patients, if you asked them, would talk about really horrible events in childhood. They wouldn't really talk about them until you asked them. But it, over the years, I got to the point where I always, you know, initially, sort of naively, I didn't bother. But towards the end, you know, I would always say, particularly people who hear voices, I'd say, oh, sometimes people 
who have these experiences tell me that some bad things have happened to them in childhood. I'm just wondering whether something like that, something has happened to you. And very often they would report experiences of sexual abuse. Interestingly enough, very often they wouldn't make connections between that and their symptoms. They would say something like, oh yeah, no, I had this, this uncle who sexually assaulted me and it was pretty bad, but I got over it. And they wouldn't see the connection. But this has been a highly controversial area in schizophrenia research. People have been, in, particularly within the biological society, the psychiatry sort of end of the, the, the sort of academic spectrum, very reluctant to think about this as a risk factor. So a few years ago, uh, myself and Filippo Varese, who's a young, fantastic psychologist, uh, Italian psychologist who, who works in, in Britain and who I've done a lot of collaborative work with, uh, Filippo and I thought, you know, we need to seal this. We need to find out what overall the evidence is. So we're doing a meta-analysis, and we got some money uh, for about a year. It took us about a year to do this. We'd been starting on this for... Um, uh, a f we'd been doing that it about two months when we came across this, uh, when we discovered that other people were also working in the same area. Actually, it was a kind of slightly funny story, because at the time I was staying in a cottage in North Wales in a remote section of the Conway Valley, and you could just about get a cell phone system if you stood on the fireplace and stu stuck, your, stuck your phone up like this. And I just wanted to kind of find out what was going on, so I did this. And I got accidentally copied in a, into an email between uh, a New Zealand researcher, John Reid, and a um, uh, uh, Dutch researcher, Jim Van Os. And they'd been having... I, it, it was prompted by, before I'd gone up to Wales, I'd sent them one of the latest papers on the topic, a uh, particularly interesting one from Australia, and they, they'd start a conversation between them. And uh, John knew that I was working on this meta-analysis, but anyway, this the email came back from Jim, and it said, i better get on with my meta-analysis, and I thought, shit. So um, I immediately sent an email to John, which said, bloody hell, is Jim doing a meta-analysis? And I didn't send it to John. I sent it to Jim, accidentally. <laughs> I then got an email back which said, why bloody hell? <laughs> I was on a plane to Amsterdam within 48 hours. And uh, Filippo and I went to Amsterdam and we decided to pull our resources. So it was a joint project between ourselves and the Maastricht group in the end, which was just as well because it took a lot of work. Because our initial computer search found 27,000 hits which we whittled down to 763 papers which actually had to be read by someone and most of them were read by Filippo. Every so often during that year I would sort of pass by the department on a Saturday or a Sunday morning to pick up someone which I'd forgotten and there would be Filippo sitting in front of the screen and I'd say, How it's going? how's it going Filippo? And he'd say, 632, only about 100 left to go. Anyway, we got it down to eight epidemiological cross-sectional studies, uh, ten prospective studies, or quasi-prospective studies. So these were, some of these were both cohorts, but some of them were, uh, one particularly interesting one was from Australia, which actually looked at children who were known to being sexually abused because they'd been subject to legal process, and they'd been followed up to adulthood. And actually, interestingly enough, in an initial report from that group, it was the only study which didn't report a link with psychosis, but in a later follow-up, they did, and the reason for that was because the people were very young when they produced the first report, uh, so they hadn't had a chance to become psychotic. We also looked at patient control studies. These are studies where you interview patients about their life experiences and you interview controls. Now, historically, these studies have been mistrusted because the assumption has been that patients can't be trusted to talk about their early lives. I'm about to show you some evidence that they can be trusted. So this is the forest plot. Um, for those of you who don't know forest plots, uh, have we got a pointer? Yep. The middle. The middle one, okay. To be careful, make sure I don't laze my own eye. Um, okay, so what we've got here is, um, so this shows the data from each individual study. So the point in the middle is the uh, odds ratio from the study, and the increased risk of psychosis in the sample. Um, so the scale on the bottom is odds ratios. Odds ratio of 1 means there's no effect. Anything to that side means that uh, there's a decreased risk of psychosis. Anything to this side shows an increased risk of psychosis. For each study, we have the confidence intervals. So for confidence intervals, don't intersect the line of no effect. It means there's a significant effect. 
Um, and we've got the case control studies at the top, the epidemiological studies in the middle, and the prospective studies uh, at the bottom. And we've got the summary uh, effects in these kind of rhomboid shapes, and then the overall summary effect there. So the first thing to note is that, with one exception, everything is this side of the line. So the data is very, very consistent. The exception is a study which apparently in Japan shows that if your parent dies early in life, then you have a decreased risk of psychosis. I have no idea why that would be, whether it's something about Japan or something about, I don't know, who knows. But it doesn't matter, because if you include this study or you exclude it, you get the same result. Okay? So we did both. So you can see that what's, what is amazing is just how consistent these findings are. They're very, very consistent across the three different designs. It doesn't matter which design you do. And you end up with an odds ratio of about three in each type of approach. And the fact that we get the same odds ratio for the patient control studies as we do in the epidemiological studies and the cross-sectional and the prospective studies suggests that what the patients are telling us is true. So, you know, there are you do come across the patient who tells you about the traumatic experience they had when they were Queen of England or something of that sort, but that's very rare. Mostly when they talk to you about their early life experience, they're telling it as they experienced it. Um, looking at the studies in detail, we found that uh, 9 out of 10 of the epidemiological data sets had actually reported dose-response relationships, and, uh, sorry, been interrogated for dose-response relationships. So 10 had been interrogated for dose-response relationships, and 9 had found a dose-response relationship. So a dose-response relationship is what we would expect if the effect was causal. So, um, one example is a study uh, analysis of the U.S. National Comorbidity Survey by Mark Shefflin and his colleagues. They found that the bare odds ratio for somebody who had reported one type of childhood trauma on a long list was about 2.53, so about the same as our overall odds ratio. But the people who reported five or more, the odds ratio increased to 53. So Paul Bevington once said to me, any geneticist who found an odds ratio to 53 would already have booked their steamer ticket to Stockholm. This is a massive effect. It's much bigger than you find it any, any, for any, any single gene. The highest odds ratio, incidentally, for any single uh, allele associated with psychosis, with the exception of a small number of things called... Uh, there's a, a particular type of genetic abnormality, which is very rare and found only a tiny fraction of patients, called a copy number variation. That's higher odds ratios, but... Other than they, that, that, that exception, the highest odds ratio is somewhere between 1.1 and 1.2. So this is mu these are much bigger effects. It's kind of useful to compare it with uh, a risk which we're familiar with. So I looked to see where we could find some um, meta-analysis of uh, smoking and lung cancer, and I found one which looked at squamous cell carcinoma. I don't exactly know what that is, but apparently it's the commonest form of lung cancer. Uh, and uh, they looked at the risk associated with smoking cigarettes between 1 and 40 years. And the risk rose from 3 to 33, uh, to alteration between 3 and 33. So that's about the same magnitude. So the risk of becoming psychotic given, a child, given childhood trauma is about the same as the risk of um, getting lung cancer given smoking cigarettes. So a sizable risk, I would say. Um, you can also calculate something called the population attributable risk, or the population attributable fraction. This is an estimate of the proportion of people who would not be psychotic if the risk factor was eliminated. Okay. So obviously it requires a lot of inference to come to this calculation. We found in the individual studies, they varied between 15% and 48%, with uh, a mean of 33%. So, according to this, there will be one-third less people with psychosis if we could eliminate the specific types of childhood trauma which we have identified uh, in this meta-analysis. And I should say this is an underestimate of social causation because there are lots of social factors which are not included in the meta-analysis. Um, to put it in context, this is uh, a kind of quite... If in Britain, this would be well-known, but I couldn't think... I didn't have time to find an Italian equivalent, but this is a place called Huddersfield, and it's a kind of medium-sized city in Britain. Uh, its population is about 160,000. That's the number of schizophrenia patients who would not have schizophrenia 
if we eliminated their risk factor. So you have to imagine a small city full of patients and they suddenly get better if we had a time machine and gave them a better childhood. Um, I mentioned there are other social risk factors involved. One which we've been looking at recently uh, is called communication deviance. And this is, I haven't got really time to go into this, but I'm just going to mention it in passing because I think it's fascinating. It's an area which has been researched mainly by US researchers. British researchers have pretty much completely ignored it for various reasons. Uh, it's a style of speaking which parents, some parents have to their children, which is basically fragmented and difficult to follow. It involves a loss of, of what are called, re it, it, it makes it, if you're listening to someone who communication deviates, it's difficult to follow what they're referring to a lot of the time. Okay? It's not pathological in the sense of formal thought disorder, but it's just difficult to follow. And a long time ago, some American psychologists and psychiatrists, Singer and Wynn, argued that constant exposure to this type of speech in childhood would lead to cognitive impairment, which would make an increased risk of psychosis in adulthood. They thought it was chronic exposure to this type of speech which is important. Now, there are some genetically informed studies of communication deviants, um, including a fantastic adoption study in Finland carried out by Pekka Tianari. So we have good reasons for believing this effect is largely environmental rather than genetic. Uh, we carried out, we published uh, a little while ago, uh, a meta-analysis in uh, Schizophrenia Bulletin and again, we found a very consistent effect. The interesting thing was that the effect was um, actually uh, for mothers, not for fathers. We didn't find a significant effect of father's communication deviance. So if you have a mother with communication deviance, there's an increased risk of psychosis, but not if father has communication deviance, it doesn't really matter all that much. This is part, I guess, this is conforms to the standard rule in psychopathology, which is that mothers always get blamed. Um, I, I think the reason is because most of us spend a lot more time with our mothers when we're young than we do with our fathers. So how, how, how have people reacted to these kind of findings? Well, when we published our meta-analysis on childhood trauma, um, the editor of the journal, Will Carpenter, thought it was significant, sufficiently important to commission an editorial to comment on it. And the editorial was written by a chap called Ezra Susser, who is a biological psychiatrist. Um, but she's a psychiatric epidemiologist. Um, the amazing thing is that usually, if you have a meta-analysis, consistency of the findings is a reason to feel confident. Uh, but not in this particular instance, apparently. Uh, Susser smelt a bit of a rat, and he thought the evidence was too consistent. And he thought the reason for this is because patients are biased in their reporting of childhood trauma. But of course, some of the studies were epidemiological studies, so they weren't studies of patients, and some of them were studies of, um, were prospective studies of people who were known to have experienced trauma who later became psychotic. So you can't make that claim. Um, uh, actually, he did say at the end of the editorial, well, perhaps the prospective studies should be considered separately. Well, I submit that perhaps they shouldn't. It's the fact that they're consistent with the other studies which is interesting in this case. In fact, uh, Helen Fisher recently um, published an interesting study where she looked at how stable patients' reports of childhood trauma were when they, after they recovered from illness, they still said the same things about their childhood. And in some cases, it's possible to get reports from SIPs about whether these traumatic events have really occurred. So it, there is good evidence that the patients are. It's not just the evidence from the meta-analysis. There's other evidence, which is that patients are, broadly speaking, telling the truth about their childhood experiences. Other people have come up with, I think, probably more... I would say, sort of desperate attempts to explain uh, these kind of associations. So there was a narrative review published at the same time as our meta-analysis by Sedeli and others. Um, and they noted that there was a strong uh, association between childhood sexual abuse and psychosis in the literature. They didn't produce any formal numbers. They just, they just, they just narrative review. But they said the possibility cannot be ruled out that a child destined to develop schizophrenia may show characteristics in childhood that increase the risk of abuse. So the idea is here is that if you've got schizophrenia genes, you might behave in a way which causes other people to abuse you. I think that's pretty unlikely, it seems to me. So is this effect causal? This chap here is somebody who I always teach students about now, but has largely been forgotten by, by 
you know, general medical or, or psych psychological audiences. But he's probably one of the most important people in the history of modern medicine. He's called Austin Bradford Hill. He wasn't a doctor. He was an epidemiologist. He was actually a statistician. He did two fantastic things which we should be grateful for. The first was that he, he, is, he designed the first ever modern randomised control trial. So RCTs come from his work. All of them do. But also, um, he was one of the people who discovered the link between smoking and lung cancer. He wasn't the only person. There were research groups in America as well, as well as Britain. But in Britain, in Britain there's usually somebody called Richard Doll who's associated, who's, a trip, who's, who, who's given credit for this. But you have to understand that Doll was Bradford Hill's PhD student at the time. So, um, and when the link between smoking and lung cancer came out, first became, came out, it was actually amazingly controversial. We now think it's just obvious that there's a link. But at the time, people found it really difficult to believe. And there were very heated debates at epidemiology conferences. There's a famous story about some epidemiologists in the exasperation thumping the desk and saying, in God we trust, but everyone must have data. And uh, you know, because people wouldn't sort of, you know, would make claims about data. Well, this led Hill to wonder whether you could draw criteria for looking at whether effects were causal or not from epidemiological data. And he came up with nine, which are called the Hill criteria. And actually, there's slightly different versions of the Hill criteria floating around because he wrote about them more than one cup time. But okay, this is this is what this is my understanding of this. So first of all, strength of the association. We do have a strong association here. Consistency of the data. It's very consistent, too consistent for some people's liking. Uh, specificity, I'm going to come back to that. Temporal relationship. Does the cause precede the effect? Childhood trauma, adult psychosis. Of course it does. <coughs> Is there what Hill called the biological gradient, or we will call dose-response relationship? Yes, there is. Plausibility in terms of mechanisms. I'll come back to this. Coherence with other data. So this is like looking at other kind of studies, such as animal studies. What happens if you traumatise animals? And there are ways of doing this artificially. There's a paradigm called social defeat paradigm, and the dopamine system in the brain becomes sensitised as a consequence of trauma. And that's really important, because we know that dopamine is involved in psychosis at some level. Reversibility. If you get rid of the cause, does the effect go away? So if you stop people from smoking, do the rates of lung cancer go down? Well, we know the answer to that is yes. In this area, there is only one study which has addressed this, and it's an Irish study, a really fascinating study, of children who showed SIDS syndrome or psychotic symptoms. And what they found was that these children, it's a study by Kelleher, it's published in the American Journal of, in the last couple of years. What they found was that children who showed SIDS syndrome or psychotic symptoms, uh, they had a high, it was very likely they were being bullied. But they also found that if they eliminated the bullying, if policies were put in place to get rid of the bullying, and the children were followed up a year later. Those who were no longer bullied, the subsyndromal symptoms went away. So we have some evidence of, of reversibility. And then consideration of alternative explanations. Well, some of these studies have been genetically informed, so genes have been considered. The genes, undoubtedly, by the way, do moderate these effects. It would be very surprising if they, they didn't. But two issues which have become important for people are specificity and... Uh, uh, mechanisms. And then, uh, if I can just go on for another 10 minutes and just say a few words about each of those. So one of the things is we wonder whether there might be specific effects in this, this area. So we started analysing our own, kind of doing our own epidemiological analyses of data sets which we could just download actually. Someone. So this is a study called the British Psychiatric Morbidity Survey. It runs every seven years. It has 7,000 people who are given detailed psychiatric interviews. It's a random probability sample of the British population. And we looked at, and they asked about a whole range of different traumatic events in childhood, such as um, being raped, non-consensual penetrative sex before the age of 16, it's being inappropriately touched, inappropriately talked to, physical abuse, bullying. Now, institutional care is being brought up in a children's home. Um, there's actually massive evidence now that being brought up in children's home is a predictor of massive psychiatric problems in adulthood. And there's one thing which we should be doing as a profession, we should be figuring out how to help people in children's homes these days. But anyway, and local authority care, that's being brought up in foster care, which can be actually helpful to children who've had bad childhoods. Now we had specific predictions which were based on previous literature. 
So what we predicted was that there would be a specific association between sexual abuse and hallucinations, and that's what we found. We found that people who'd been sexually abused in childhood, who'd been raped in childhood, had an increased risk of hallucinations, that's in this column, but not of paranoid symptoms. So it's specific to hallucinations. We also found that being raised in an institution specifically increased the risk of paranoia, but not hallucinations. Now clearly if you're raised in an institution, you're brought up in children's homes, something bad has happened to your early attachment relations. So that's a clue about what's going on there. We wondered whether this effect could be replicable in a sample from another part of the world. So we looked at the US National Comorbidity Survey. These are beta values in a regression model rather than uh, odds ratios. Uh, this is uh, about 6,000 US adults who were also asked about their early life experience. Now, we again found a quite strong signal between sexual abuse in childhood and hallucinations. It was also linked to, we looked at depression in this sample, it was also linked to depression, but it wasn't linked to paranoia. And they didn't measure whether or not people had been in a children's home, but they did have a self-report measure of neglect by parents. And we found that that was specifically li linked to paranoia and not hallucinations. So we're getting something like the same kind of picture from the US sample. Most recently, uh, Mark Chevlin uh, and uh, uh, I and uh, um, several others in Mark Chevlin's group have looked at uh, a survey of psychiatric morbidity among prisoners in England and Wales. So this is a prison population interviewed why they were in prison. So they were experiencing significant trauma at the time of the interviews. And they had very similar, to, and it's a quite a large fraction of the UK prison population. And the important point to note is that these people were experiencing trauma at the time they were being interviewed. 